Hey everyone, this is Ari Witten, and welcome back to the Energy Blueprint podcast. Today I have with me uh, Austin Einhorn, who is, I love his title, it's Chief Movement Jedi and founder of Apiros, which is a basically a, a place for um, elite athletes to come and, and get cared for, get uh, coaching and, and cared for by all kinds of different specialists there. Uh, and Austin, I'll read you a bit about his background here. He is a former professional volleyball player, and he has since gone on to work with professional athletes from the NFL, NBA, uh, Major League Baseball, NHL, uh, professional golfers, professional surfers, professional volleyball players. He's, he's coached Olympic athletes, and he's really, the reason he calls himself a movement Jedi is because He's not a just a traditional like personal trainer. He's not just a traditional athletic trainer or strength and conditioning coach. He's not just a traditional uh, physical therapist. He has skills and talents and uh, abilities and knowledge that go that encompass these things, but also go beyond all of those things. And I had the pleasure of meeting him a, a couple months ago. And we got to hang out quite a bit, and he is just a, a brilliant guy. And my actual expert, I actually have some expertise going back many years in this realm of, of fitness and uh, corrective exercise and, and, and that whole realm. So I actually have a lot of expertise in that, and I was very good at what I, what I do, uh, what I did. But um, Austin takes things to a whole other level, and, and his level of knowledge and skills uh, are, are way beyond. I mean, he's the, the, the 1% of the 1% of people in this field. So um, it is my pleasure to introduce all of you to Austin Einhorn. Austin, welcome to the podcast. Dude, great to be here. Thank you for that intro. Yeah. So um, this is kind of a unique thing, right? Because my audience is not professional athletes. My audience is uh, regular people, uh, and sometimes even people with severe debilitating chronic fatigue uh, who maybe haven't done any exercise in several years. And so they might be listening to this and maybe immediately turned off, like, what the hell can I learn from some guy who trains elite athletes? Um, but I, I want to kind of set the context for this interview that we're not going to be talking about you like the, the goal of this is not to talk about your methods of how you train elite athletes. The goal is to talk about your expertise in movement and how that applies to everyone, even regular people, and how your knowledge can benefit pretty much everyone. And, and I know from talking to you from all the conversations we've had, you have a lot of wisdom to share with people. So um, what I'd like to do to get started is actually have you talk a bit about your background and how you got into this field and how you became the movement Jedi that you are. I think it, I mean, if we want to go back as far as when it started, I've always been a, a passionate observer of movement. I mean, I still remember playing soccer um, in Encinitas, uh, and I'd watch a kid run. I was so fast. I was like, but his feet are pointing weird directions, but he's so fast. And that was just, I didn't know what to make of that. And um, fast forward to college, we didn't have the budget to have a normal like strength and condition coach. And since I was the guy who trained the most and relatively knew the most, um, my coach ended up making it a requirement that everyone had to train with me at least once or twice a week. <laughs> Not that I knew what I was doing. Um, and, you know, at that time in college, everyone is wondering and being asked, what are you going to do next? What, what's, what are you going to do with your life? I'm like, I don't know. Um, I was going to prolong that as long as I could with a professional volleyball career. I bought a one-way ticket to Europe, tried out, made a team in Germany, thought I was going to stay playing for three to five years and then figure everything else out. I hated it. I quit like three quarters of the way through the season, traveled the rest of Europe, spent a lot of time staring out a window on 15 hour train rides, figuring out, okay, what am I going to do when I get home? All my friends were going back to school because I mean, who really starts a career after just their undergrad these 
these days. That was the expectation that I uh, was putting on myself. And so I had a sushi with, uh, I had sushi with some friends who were working at a PT facility. And they're like, awesome, we have this aid opening. You should interview to be a physical therapy aid. Sure, I'd love that. I'll go to PT school if I like it. Within about a month or so, I realized this isn't for me. I don't want to do physical therapy. But I really liked what I was learning there. So I stuck around to learn what they were teaching me. And then one of the bosses was like, why don't you get your CSCS? And just like many of the listeners, they're like, what the hell is a CSCS? That's, and he told me it's a certified strength and conditioning specialist credential. And I was like, wait, I could do that as my career? Okay. Fast forward, I'm certified and been kind of coaching for a year very loosely. I get my first professional athlete, um, Dwight Lowry. And this is kind of my uh, Robert Frost moment when I decided to take one path of, uh, instead of another. Four weeks after we were training, uh, he improved his vertical by six inches. You and can't that use was just, jargon with, uh, with regular people, man. You, you got uh, to okay. not use athlete speak. He, he improved his vertical jump. <laughs> Sorry. So he could jump a certain amount of inches. Let's say it was 36 inches in the air. <laughs> and it, within four weeks... Um, we moved it up to 42 inches in the air, wow. which is a lot in that amount of time, especially for somebody who's been in the NFL for six years at the time. It wasn't like he had not trained at all. He was already the top 1% of football players in the world. Yeah, and just I'll just interject some context, which is that when you're working with somebody who's already an elite athlete, you're talking about improvements on the order of 1%, 2%, 5%, not, you know, a 20% or, or 30% improvement. So that just so people understand that that is a huge uh, level of improvement that we're talking about. Yeah. And uh, I, at that point that like validated what I was doing with my life and, or what I like, what I did for him. And I saw him you know, in a very intimidating grown man, get like schoolboy giddy about his potential. Mm. And after that, we we dove into a very deep relationship and we're still good friends today. Um, he just retired and I love that we're still talking and hanging out. Um, and at that moment, I was like, I love this. I want to dedicate my life to this. Mm. And it's been a pretty fast growth curve. That was five years ago. Um, and here we are today. Beautiful. Beautiful. And, and since then, you've not only worked with one professional athlete, but you've worked with dozens of professional athletes in, in lots of different sports. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, I, I, I kind of relish in the fact that I'm one of the younger people in my field at the position that I'm at, at. and um, I just spoke at this first inaugural uh, type of sport skill acquisition conference in Minnesota, and I was the youngest presenter presenting against uh, next to people that have theories with their names in them and textbooks, and um, I'm just so happy and grateful that uh, I've been able to get where I am and help as many people as I have been able to who you know, have sought out so many other people and then they come to me and I offer them immense amounts of value. Um, it's really fulfilling. And then I do work with general population from time to time. And, um, you know, it, it's very valuable for them. It's, I mean, it's just as fulfilling to work with them too. Just different goals are, uh, different goals are accomplished. Yeah. Beautiful, man. Well, I, I love when, uh, you know, kind of the stars align in just the right way where you have, the right person with the right brain and the right passions kind of falling into the life circumstances that, that send them down a pathway that's just aligned perfectly with their skill sets and their talents and their passions and kind of the melding of all those things creates this kind of uh, this, this beautiful thing where you get a person who's super passionate and is amazing at what they do and, and, and brilliant at what they do. And so, you are, are in that category when it comes to movement. So when with, with 
that in mind, knowing that you have this background working with professional athletes, what does the, the listener to this podcast, the average person, um, have to gain? What do they have to gain from listening to this conversation and from your knowledge? What can they glean from it that can benefit their lives? A lot. Let me start with, <laughs> let me start with pain. I think that almost, I think it's so much pain in almost every non-contact injury, meaning someone doesn't crash into your knee or hit you by a car um, injuries. You know, you fall or you pick something up and you strain your back, you pull your back. That's the comical movie moment. I think they're all can be prevented. Even the ones at 75, 80 years old. I think the fact that so many elderly are, that break their hips and are terrified to break their hip, I um, think that can be prevented. So if you don't have to think about pain in your day-to-day life and are not fearful about your grandkids running up and jumping on you, I think overall quality of life is improved, as well as uh, anything else that your body needs to send energy to will, will have more resources to do that if it's not constantly repairing a tiny meniscus tear or a movement that's creating a tear in your meniscus from your every day-to-day life mm-hmm. yeah absolutely there's also this um this relationship of of pain to energy levels in particular that, that i've found where um and and also to to joint mobility Um, and to just like movement in general. So like the more restricted a person tends to be in their their bodily movements, the more that their body has lost the capability to move through proper range of motions, the more pain they tend to have. And the more pain a person tends to have, um, that pain tends to sap their energy levels. Um, And and I mean, literally there's different brain circuitry that's being activated when you lose uh, when you're when you're in pain that I think directly detracts from feeling energetic It's it's almost like the pain and inflammation like send your body into more of a, a rest and rehabilitation mode um, They're kind of like cueing you to like 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 rest we need to heal instead of like hey your body's functioning great go move around a lot You know what I mean? Yeah, I think I think of trust and confidence as an equation of behavior over time. And if you don't have a lot of movement behavior over time, there's not a whole lot of trust or or confidence that your body can have in its movement. And so there's more and more research saying that after surgery or with pain and in, yeah, with pain science, more movement is better Mm -hmm. because pain oftentimes is the teacher. There's a quote that I love by Vladimir Yonda, and it's pain is the only way the musculoskeletal system can protect itself. It's speaking to you. Mm -hmm. If you get food poisoning, you're going to throw it up because your digestive system is trying to protect itself. And so pain is viewed as this obstacle or very negative thing. I love pain. When I have pain, I kind of get excited because now I know I'm going to have this teacher with me all the time as long as I choose to appreciate it. And then I can start moving a little bit more and learning about, oh, I can have more pain here. Or I can even ask, does this actually hurt? Or am I just creating this in my mind? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's just a, just a big stretch. It's actually not, not pain. Mm. Interesting. I mean, that, that, frame shift is huge because most people experience pain and they just they're like ah oh, man i'm in pain this hurts i need to take a painkiller to get out of pain why is that paradigm problem yeah it, it promotes a little it promotes a little bit of a, a victim mindset mm-hmm. i think and um and that they don't have the solution within themselves they need some external they need some as seen on tv copper knee brace or a pill or cream Um, or something they see on Shark Tank that claims to remove back pain, but uh, your body and brain have the tools. It's just finding somebody to open your toolbox for you or show you what tools you can have. Yeah. 
Yeah, interesting. So with the regular person in mind, the average listener who maybe, let's say, is either not doing any exercise or maybe exercises regularly but doesn't particularly like have any idea of what they're really doing, doesn't have any expertise in this area, um, and doesn't have any understanding of biomechanics or movement or, or any of this stuff that you're an expert in, what are some of the big areas of, of specific tips and strategies that we can start to talk about to, um, to benefit people's lives? And I, I guess, well, I'll phrase, I actually know the answer to this since we've talked in preparation for this podcast and, and we've gone over all these different ones. So I guess I'll, I'll be more specific and just say, um, I know we've talked about, you know, the, one of the first ones we talked about is feet. And I know you're really big into um, the feet and how the feet move and proper foot function and foot health. So can you talk a bit about that and why it's important for people to, to move their feet in the right way and have good foot health? Yeah. Your foot is the, one of the main interfaces we have with the earth. And if we think about gravity as an energy, um, and I'm going to try and make this more about energy since that's the podcast, your foot is the interface where you get to transfer your energy into the earth and receive it back to the earth. And the um, more efficient your foot functions and the more closely to its um, somewhat ideal functionality, the better your energy will flow to and from the earth the better the rest of your body will stack up upon that. And why it's become so much more important these days is because of the external environments we put them in, being socks, shoes, concrete, um, tile, wood, whatever, instead of a very dynamic environment. And so something I'm sure you've talked about and your listeners have probably know is that just like with your diet, you want to have a diverse diet. You want to have a diverse and movement environment and a diverse environment for your foot. Mm. So being able to walk on sand, pebbles, maybe in a river, on a wooden log, yes, on concrete, on grass, even grass, lumpy grass, a sideway or a hill facing the hill, maybe facing left on the hill and right on the hill, going down the hill slowly. Um, and so that your foot can operate in its dy true dynamic nature and accommodate it to the environment. But when we wear tight socks and shoes um, that are tight, shoes that are tight, not all shoes are bad, um, it changes the nature of our foot, which then changes the nature of our ankle and then up the stream. Mm. And along with this, right now, there's this big positive fad of barefoot everything mm. barefoot walking barefoot running um vibram five fingers for your training or zero drop shoes and um yes and that's not enough to actively work against what the socks and shoes have done to our feet mm. um, your socks and shoes are confining your foot and making it more narrow and and rigid and you need to actively open that back up and work against it instead of just going barefoot. Just going barefoot is a positive step up, but then we can do some very simple things to restore your foot functionality, and you'll feel different throughout your entire body. You'll walk different. You'll stand different. You might notice differences in the ground so you don't trip over something or you don't trip and fall and break your hip, things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I want to just ground this in, in context, kind of going back to what we were getting at earlier, which is to not get lost in, in the details of, we're talking about foot function, which might seem like an obscure thing, like why should I care whether my foot is in a sock or not, or is, is barefoot or not, or I have zero drop shoes, like this seems like a small issue. But ultimately, all these little aspects of movement lead to you having a more functional, more pain-free more energetic body that's going to not have arthritis and joint problems and injuries as you get older, you're going to be healthier and more functional and learning about this stuff really translates into that. So I just want to kind of remind people of that context as, as we're talking about like these seemingly very obscure details around like the, 
the kind of shoes that a person is wearing. Um, but yeah, the, the foot stuff is, is very interesting. So would you recommend uh, not wearing socks or doing like five finger socks or um, doing barefoot shoes? What, what's your kind of ideal when it comes to that? So as far as the external environment, um, yes, the five finger socks, if you can afford them. Um, I have several pair, but I don't have enough to fill my wardrobe. I go through socks crazily enough, a uh, crazy amount. And so I have, I've found these Puma socks that are um, stretchy enough and very thin in the toe area where I can manually spread out my foot or my toes just um, by controlling my feet individually and mm. that they will open up and splay and there's minimal tension along my toes. I know dress socks are also typically good for this. Um, the Pumas they seem to last a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. As far as shoes, we would want something ideally that's uh, flat. So there's the heel is the same height as the toes and wide enough where your toes don't hit the edges. Mm -hmm. and then, so, so that the, the toes especially can kind of spread out and move more naturally rather than being sort of forced together into that like tight pattern. Exactly. Imagine the difference between a motorcycle and a car with four wheels. Mm. Gotcha. Have more surface area, more balance, more different environments we can go over and not fall over. Okay. And then the other thing is like diverse foot nutrition of walking on different surfaces and, and kind of different terrain to allow the, the foot muscles and the, the muscles around the ankle to, to kind of activate properly. Yeah, if you can. If not, the, the lowest hanging fruit would be to interlace your fingers in between your toes and you go all the way down to the knuckles because what we're trying to open up is the foot, not just the toes. And then getting creative and exploring the movements that your foot is capable of, being gentle, listening to your body. Don't just torque through something, more isn't always better. Mm -hmm. And explore big movements and really, really subtle movements. Gotcha. Okay, so that's feet. What, what other areas should people be aware of? What other things are going on in people's lives that, that you think are really important um, detractors from physical function? So the next three things that I would think about, and we'll go segmentally through each one, but the waistband of clothes and how that interferes with your whole system, sitting, and shoulders. Okay. And so the waistband, there's probably very few people that I know that even sleep naked. Almost everybody is wearing a waistband 24 hours a day, from diapers to death. Um, and depending on the elasticity or the stiffness of this waistband, it really is going to offset how efficient you are not only at movement, it can affect back pain and your digest digestive quality and your breathing ability. So when we stand and then we sit down, our stomach is supposed to expand as our hips bend. Our stomach is supposed to get bigger. And when that's restricted by a waistband, the organs that are beneath your stomach tissue or beneath the surface, they gotta go somewhere. And a lot of times they're going to go up into your lungs or your intestines that are there are going to then press against your liver and your stomach. Sometimes that might result in, say, an acid reflux or some indigestion, constipation, um, back pain a lot of times. Because if your stomach can't go forward, it's going to want to go backwards and it might take your back with it. So then your back is more likely to round and compress and shear. And that might result in the back pain epidemic that we have today. I think clothes are definitely part of that. Um, breathing. If your liver and your stomach are being shoved up into your lungs, you're not going to be able to breathe nearly as efficiently. And if you're breathing how many thousand times a day, and all of those are restricted because of a waistband, you're not then getting as efficient of oxygen return um, throughout your whole body. Does that touch on some of the points there? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think there's an obvious interface with, with overall energy levels here, which is, you know, even like a, a, a one or, or 
two or three percent inefficiency or or increased resistance of each breath which is like probably sub perceptible a person's not even going to notice it but it's going to result in in, in this very subtle chronic um, low level deficiency of of oxygen in the system they're just not oxygenating and and removing waste products through the breath as efficiently as they should be and you know that, that totally. could add up so yeah the, the wingspan stuff is is very interesting i've never heard anybody talk about this i have to say that i've always personally been annoyed with waistbands and kind of noticed them like and and found them very annoying in terms of like just the, the physical it doesn't feel right to to have them um but i've never heard anybody actually talk about them in the way that you talk about it so i, I find that fascinating so the the next one is sitting is that right yeah and one last thing about the, the waistbands um yeah and it's a good segue in the sitting is and where i'm an event where i need i want to care about my social appearance and value where i will wear a slacks some sort of slacks or jeans i simply just unbutton it when i sit down um, um, unless my shirt is tucked in um however i'm going to a wedding this weekend <laughs> There you go. I'm like, hey, um, man, I, I hope you don't mind, but these waistbands are really chafing me. So. Yeah, I'll put them on when I stand up, but just <laughs> don't look under the table. Um, yeah, it's just simple. It's just you unbutton to sit and button back up when you stand. Nice. Um, and definitely no belts. Cool. Um, yeah, otherwise stretchy waistbands. And with sitting, We need to earn our sitting time more effectively. Uh, these days, in order to accomplish what a lot of people want to accomplish in their life, it revolves, it necessitates sitting in front of a screen or just sitting to drive or some sort of sitting. And so there's this compressional effect and breathing issue when we sit, even even after if we have the stretchy waistband, we're still gonna probably slouch and reduce our breathing efficiency. Um, and so I would encourage people to find ways to decompress their spine. And that's where I'm uh, releasing my, my movement vitamins online, but I'm also going to release my free anti-sitting series, something that people can do to earn their sitting time. So for instance, I'm flying to this wedding, it's going to be a two to three hour flight sitting in a chair that's way too small for me in the airport and probably after i'm going to do these for maybe five to ten minutes to help decompress my spine so that i can afford to then sit in this tiny chair for two to three hours another low hanging fruit pun intended is just to hang from a pull-up bar or a tree branch i think it's um I think it's kind of funny that there's these expensive inversion boots to to like acrobat your way up to a bar and hook your feet into, or these expensive inversion tables or traction tables to decompress your spine. However, if you just use your hands and hold onto a pull-up bar and relax, you're gonna let gravity, again, this free energy that's always there, help decompress our spine and uh, open up our body like an accordion and reduce some uh, functionality to our shoulders that uh, I believe are built to hang and swing from branches to branches. And uh, without that behavioral stimulus, our shoulders will change. Mm. Ex elaborate on that a bit more. What, what do you mean by that? This concept of we're built to hang and what's actually going on in the shoulder joint if we lose this activity of hanging in our lives and how does that actually translate into something that that matters on a practical level for for people listening so um i can't use any visuals but your shoulder socket you can think of uh two different roofs a snow roof that's quite steep um and in there is the ball in the socket in this steep roof and as the arm comes up that steep roof impinges or hits against the arm and can create some issues and uh, 
pain or even tears and injuries. However, um, when we hang a lot, that Tahoe roof will flatten out to like an LA roof where it's flat and open and spacious um, so that the arm has a lot of room to move and that the whole roof will cooperate a lot better with that. Um, and it's going to help decompress and mobilize our, our rib cage, where, especially where the shoulders are. And for women, I find this to be hugely beneficial because they're wearing a bra all the time, um, which is like a second waistband. And so ribs, like three through five, are really constricted as well for them. And so I find hanging can help open this up a lot as well. Beautiful. What, what else? So we've talked about waistbands. We've talked about sitting. We've talked about hanging. Uh, what was the third one beyond? Uh, hanging. Okay, it was hanging. Okay. Yeah, so but I haven't talked else? about we squatting. Have... Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I'm interrupting, but I haven't talked about squatting. Okay, let's do that. Um, and I know we're running short on time here, but so think about the accordion of your body. Uh, lengthening out, getting the full stretch hanging, and then squatting would be the full compression, a deep squat. Um, I really don't like that's being called a third world squat these days, because why should this type of movement be labeled as only what's done in third worlds? Mm. Um, I don't know if you notice right now, but I'm on the ground right now. I don't own chairs anymore. Um, because I like being on the ground and having this slightly less comfortable environment, which requires me to move around mm -hmm. a lot more. One of the positions I've hit is a deep squat. And so knowing that most people listening are not going to be able to get to the bottom and rest, and that's okay. Eventually, your body will adapt to get there. It's adapted to a chair and a very elevated squat. It can unlearn that and adapt to a deep restful squat and this is very good for the hips the spine the knees the ankles your organs the digestion and i know a squatty potty is getting very popularized these days yeah. which is basically an elevated floor for you, to, for you to poop yeah and and just to clarify for people listening who are maybe not familiar with that term third world squat, explain what that is in this kind of idea of, of a deep restful squat. I know it's kind of a little hard to illustrate without a visual, but. So a deep restful squat would be, um, I view a squat as just moving your center of mass, maybe around your belly button straight down to the ground. Um, there's a lot of myths around the squat where your butt has to go back or your knees can't go in front of your toes. Um, but really it's just how low can you get your butt to the ground, keeping your feet flat on the floor. Ideally, most people won't get their feet flat to the floor and that's okay. Over time that can happen and you can hold on to some objects for balance every now and then. This is my movement and vitamin number one for anybody who, wants an in-depth instructional video for this. Um, but but uh, yeah, does that elaborate and paint the picture well enough? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a pooping position, obviously, uh, but it's also a resting position traditionally for humans. For, I mean, if you, if you look at like modern day hunter-gatherer tribes and even, uh, you know, a, a lot of people that are not necessarily hunter-gatherers, but just kind of regular people in, in certain countries still living more traditional lifestyles where they're outdoors, they're, they're working outdoors. You'll often see people kind of like guys, you know, eating lunch in like, in a, in a just stand in a, in, a, in a deep squat position, but they're just kind of resting in this squat position. Um, basically with their kind of like their butt and their hamstrings like on their calves, um, and just kind of hanging out there, kind of their, all of their weight being supported by their joints. Uh, but modern humans have basically lost that function. Um, they've lost the joint mobility to be able to actually get into that position. So if you ask a modern human, a Westerner, to go into that position, first of all, they won't even be able to get into it. They will actually lose their balance and fall backwards, or they'll just stop, you know, several inches above that point and you know their bodies won't go any further 
and they'll and they'll be working really hard you know all their muscles will be engaged so they won't actually be able to enter into that deep restful squat what some people call a third world squat um and so what you're saying is with practice you can train yourself into that and that's opening up uh multiple joints of your body in, in very beneficial ways is that accurate Absolutely. Totally. And then it becomes a really useful tool for, tool for you. I was, wait, I was waiting in line at the DMV for two and a half, three hours a few weeks ago. And everyone else is standing and getting really uncomfortable and assuming these like bad postures. And luckily I then get to sit or I'd squat. And it was a savior for me. Mm -hmm. And I just squatted and read. If it moved forward, I just kind of stayed in my squat and just hobbled forward and kind of stayed here for a long long time yeah yeah and at, at the end of the day those little things actually really add up whether you whether you were the person at the DMV who, were, who was just standing still in a crappy posture or sitting in a chair in a crappy posture not moving or you were moving your body through ranges of motion gently and actually engaged in movement engaged in opening up the joints at the end of the day your body is experiencing a lot less pain and and you feel a lot better totally and then your energy can go towards other things yeah absolutely so hanging deep squat uh closed waistband sitting feet um one other thing i know we wanted to cover is is muscle tone and length tension relationships and, and kind of balance of muscles across joints can you talk a bit about that yeah so it's kind of this other myth these days that even a lot of athletes believe and people that um you're just stiff and you're just more flexibility is better and you know there's pictures of serena williams that are um praised with her doing the splits and hitting a forehand and well while well, sure that's impressive and rare it's not that great and that there is more or less um the idea of being too flexible and that having a functional stiffness in certain places is quite useful and so um you can think of uh, elasticity of let's say a sock and you grab the toes and the end of the sock and you stretch it all the way out what is going to happen to this sock if you hold this stretch or repeat this stretch every single day for a long run of time i'm asking you yeah it's it's problematic i mean what what comes to mind is actually i've had a number of um, yoga practitioners and yoga teachers that i've known over the years who stretch and stretch and stretch, they stretch their hamstrings like crazy. And then I will often hear them remark, like constantly, my hamstrings are really tight. I need to stretch out my hamstrings. Like they constantly feel a tightness in their hamstrings and feel compelled by their like signals from their body to stretch their hamstrings. And then when you watch them stretch their hamstrings, they're extraordinarily flexible. They're like already way too flexible and yet they're subjectively feeling this tightness yeah so um if we stretch this sock out from end to end and then we we could strum it like a guitar string guitar strings are not loose they're very tight they feel tight to the touch but when we look at it from end to end we see there's a great distance between those two that's creating this tension so the subjective experience then might be I'm really tight, but they're not noticing the end points of how stretched out they've become. Mm. And then part of their culture and their beliefs is then to continue to stretch. And, and depending on what you want to do, that might be the best thing for you. If you want to sit in the full lotus position for 14 hours a day, you're probably going to need to stretch every single day like this. Mm -hmm. However, knowing that that's going to be a sacrifice for some other things and that your energy might be depleted or when you encounter a more diverse life activity, going on a random hike with some friends, playing tennis, picking up a grandchild, playing sport with kids, or just wanting to pick up your own sport, this excessive flexibility most likely won't serve you. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, interesting. So, so what's the optimal balance there as far as stretching and not stretching? Um, you know, and uh, as a as an aside, this is a little bit of a digression, but I just came across a fascinating study um, in in mice, but really intriguing nonetheless. It actually showed it's kind of a, a weird but remarkable study. It showed that mice who were kind of forced into a stretching position sometimes. Uh, who who had cancerous tumors, the tumors grew remarkably slower than uh, mice who didn't do any of stretching. Um, I think the study the study had a very creative title. It was called "Downward Facing Mouse," and uh, it, it was very fascinating. But basically, suggesting that there seems to be some kind of uh, deeper health benefit to stretching, like overall systemic health benefit to to stretching. Um, beyond just sort of this localized, you know, lengthening of, of muscle or, or tendons. Yeah, I mean, I'm not saying all stretching is bad. I think when it's done um, ignorantly or done in excess, it can be dangerous. Um, you know, almost all animals will go into some stretching position. Those people who have cats and dogs will know they're going to do the stretching position just for a moment though, but they do it frequently mm -hmm. um, before they move around. And there's more growing research that more stretching or stretching before you go on a run or play basketball or whatever doesn't prevent injury. Um, and so, you know, stretching can be simple or complex depending on how you want to view it. I would just say people can get more informed on their stretching routine if it's being useful for what they want to do with their body and their life. Okay. Do you have any practical guidelines or, or recommendations as far as, I mean, let's just take an average person that doesn't do much activity. Should they engage in some kind of stretching routine in your opinion, or, or should they be more concerned with maybe a movement and mobility routine where they learn to take their body through different ranges of movement? I would prefer a movement that, um, a movement that results in some sort of stretch. Knowing that if something is tight and needs to be stretched, the opposing muscle is large, probably quite weak. So a tight muscle is also a very strong muscle. A long muscle is quite weak muscle. And so in finding movements that then um, would result in strengthening the opposite. So a overly simplified example would be if, say, your hamstrings are tight or your quad is probably too long and weak. If your back is tight, your abdominals would be too long and too weak. Bicep too tight tricep too weak does that make sense it's overly simplified but that would be a better framework to think of when trying to stretch yeah absolutely so let's make it practical let's say somebody who has uh tightness in their lower back what would you recommend to them to fix that or they have tightness in their hip flexors uh, maybe they're working a desk job for hours and hours each day and they feel tightness in their hip flexors. What kinds of imbalances would those people have and what would your recommendations be in those scenarios? Okay, so if they have tightness in their lower back, they probably have an arch in their lower back, which means they have too long of hamstrings. So stretching their hamstrings will not help their back, most likely. Um, and then sitting in their chair, they might feel their hip flexors be tight because they're slouching and are at their end range. So they might feel something at their hip flexors, but they are not accurately describing the feeling and that the length is too long. And what they would actually need to do is tighten their hip flexors. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. So somebody who works at a desk job, your, your recommendation would be to tighten their hip flexors more, to do hip flexor exercises? Um, yeah, but not, not isolated ones. A better one would be go climb the 
stairs at your office and take as big of steps as possible. And when you bring your knee up towards that next step, put one hand on your stomach and one hand on your low back. And as your knee comes up, you shouldn't feel much movement in your stomach or your back. Because if you're not moving your back and it's being stable, then you will be moving at your hip and flexing your hip to make that step. Mm. Gotcha. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, what about glutes? Do you have any thought on uh, thoughts on, on glutes? Because in, in my experience, this is uh, an area that is almost universally weak and underdeveloped in most people and is, and is a really important uh, muscle it involved in kind of the balance of the whole pelvis and, and hip joints and, and function in a lot of different movements. Totally. It depends on the person. If they have a, uh, let's just say, again, more simplified, if their back is round most of the time, their glutes are probably so tight, they do not know how to stretch and relax, which creates this desirable dynamic work function that we like and this um, better curvature that a lot of people are after for biological and social reasons. <laughs> um, so again, it, the opposite of the glute work is the hip flexor work. So getting in and out of hip flexion positions will get the glutes to work as long as the back stays neutral. If you bend over and your back rounds, you're not bending at your hip. Um, just because you do a deadlift, quote unquote, lifting something off the ground or picking something off the ground does not mean your glutes are working. It would depend on the state of the, the pelvis. To simplify that, guide me. How would you like me to simplify that for your audience? <laughs> um, maybe give uh, an example of how someone can strengthen their, their glutes. Okay. So if everyone at home got a broomstick, and I'm going to stand up just because I teach best when I, I can do it a little bit myself. And okay. So they got a broomstick and they held it along their back. Their hand is going to be on their low back holding the broomstick and their neck. And they're going to feel three contact points. Their head, the back of their head on the broomstick, their rib cage, or the, sorry, their back of their upper spine on the, their, the broomstick, and their sacrum. They're in between their butt cheeks. And they are going to then make their chest or make the broomstick parallel with the ground as they bend over. They should do this while staying as balanced as possible on their feet, meaning um, if their knees go backwards, all their weight's going to be on their heels. And if they do this and their weight goes to their toes, um, they're not going to be moving through their hips too well. And so uh, when they lean over, they're going to keep all three points of contact on the broom, should keep their spine in neutral, and load their hips. And so by continuing to bend here over and over, that should give them context of what a good hip hinge or deadlift movement is like, so that they could then grab a band or a light weight and repeat this into a point where they get some good uh, muscle activation and can enhance the movement quality of their low back, their knees, their hips, their feet, their brain, as they sense what is going on and get more acquainted with their body. If somebody is listening to this and they're currently not physically active, they're sedentary, they have no clue how to start moving in the direction of better physical fitness, what would be your recommendations like on a very simple practical level to help someone get started in the direction of not necessarily becoming a movement jedi like yourself but um just having some basic movement moving in the direction of movement mastery um well i i mean i selfishly think my movement vitamin video series is a great start they're designed for anybody in mind um my professional athletes do them as well as sedentary um, or people who don't have a long history of movement can do them. Um, even 
I get pictures or videos sent of this 90 year old uh, war veteran that goes through the, the, some of these movements that I didn't expect him to be able to do. And so that being said, I think anybody can do them. And if you have a little bit of common sense with it and feel your body with it, you can break them down into whatever segments are doable for you. And then I would encourage to just have more diversity of movement in your life. If you're the person who goes to the gym Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and you do your Monday workout, your Wednesday workout, and your Friday workout, and you've been doing that for 10 years, start changing things up. Okay. I know you mentioned in our, in our phone call uh, preparing for this, you mentioned walking as a big step. Uh, do you have some you. thoughts on that? Yes. Walking would be huge. I think it's, I think it's just as essential as deep squat and hanging. And when people walk, you probably are taking too long of a step. I would say shorten up your step. Um, for instance, I was on a walk with our mutual friend, Dr. Scott. His steps were longer than mine. I'm 6'4". He might be 5'11". I'm sorry if I got that wrong, Scott. But uh, <laughs> So his steps should not be longer than mine. Right? I've got much longer legs. Um, and then secondly, with the walking, just start noticing what direction your feet and your knees are pointing. Are your hands swinging? Are both of them swinging the same amount? And start having maybe a mindfulness practice with your walk. Scott doesn't know this yet because it was not the time to tell him yesterday. His left foot turns out like 30 degrees and his knee is going straight forward. He's spending a lot of energy repairing that knee from his stress every day. And why that's important to you is each step is about 150 times your weight. Um, and so if they... Ex explain what you mean by that. Okay, so your center of mass is highest once you're balancing. You're on a full limb stance. You're, if you took a picture, you're a straight line from your ear down on top of your foot. As you then step forward and reach your heel out in front of you for that next step, your center of mass goes down. And as it goes down, as it comes to earth, that gravity, um, the gravitational force of that impact is about 150 times your body weight. And so a, a hundred pound person now experiences 150 pounds for that one step. Okay, so so 150 percent, not 150 times. Uh, uh so sorry. like 100, 150%. 150 times would be an absurdly high number. That's that's what I was asking you yeah. to clarify. So it's 150 percent. So yeah, 1.5 times. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, sorry. Okay, um, sorry. Go ahead and and then that results in so you're getting this kind of excessive weight and if the angles of the biomechanics are not correct then you're creating excess stress on all those tissues which then require repair yes exactly and and knowing that it's not going to be robotic even me i consider myself a very good mover my walking is dynamic there's a high amount of variability um, but not so high that i have an asymmetry once we have an asymmetry that's when energy is being reallocated to repair tissues because over your 10,000 steps a day, you're loading those tissues not in an efficient way. And so more repair has to be done there. Mm, gotcha. Okay, so, so walking. Any practical thoughts on how somebody should begin a walking practice? Just walk. <laughs> uh, walk anywhere you want. Um, walk maybe first in a simple environment, flat neighborhood, and just look first and see are your feet and your knees pointing the same direction that you want to go um, maybe they're pointing the same direction but they're both pointing different directions that your knee both knees are pointing out and both feet are pointing out or inwards we'd like them to point where you want to go if you're going straight forward they should both point straight forward if you're turning left they're going to turn left you get the idea yeah and, then, and and it is extremely common uh, i'll add that you see people that have either both both feet and both knees pointing out or one foot 
you know, you, uh, the knees pointing straight forward and one foot on one side will be pointing like much greater to the side, like you were talking about with, with Dr. Scott. Uh, I see that kind of thing all the time. Um, also, in the context of running, especially like, uh, you Sorry, know, I'm, I'm kind of like you, yourself? I'm, I'm, I, I'm a, I'm a movement freak. So I notice when somebody's running, like going for a jog, I would say upwards of 90% of people who are running have just absolutely terrible uh, lower body biomechanics as far as the, the angles on their knee joints and, and their feet. Yeah, and the, the, unfortunately the research doesn't make running a favorable thing. Uh, a lot of people say don't run because you'll get hurt because 75 to 80% of runners get hurt and that injury reoccurs. I think that's because running is the lowest hanging fruit for fitness and everyone just thinks I can just go out and run. And yeah, I love that. But then seek some knowledgeable help on some efficient running mechanics so that you can continue to run as much as you'd like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So one last thing, and we're running short on time, but one last thing I, I wanted to cover with you is uh, if you have any practical guidelines around how someone could begin um, a like a weight training regimen or a more intense exercise fitness routine and, and kind of like your thoughts on general structure for how somebody should approach weight training because a lot of people I'd say there's a couple common pitfalls that 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 I will notice is you see women very commonly who are afraid of weights and who will either uh, only stick to the cardio machines or if they do do weights, they will stick to five and 10 and maybe 15 pound dumbbells and really like even after years of exercising, never progress beyond that. Um, and then the other big thing that I'll see is people who just do the same thing. You know, they're doing the same exercise routine that they've been doing for five years and basically in the same way um, every week, month after month, year after year. So what are, what are your thoughts on like optimal ways to, for people to think about their exercise routine and start to structure it in an intelligent way that actually gets them results? So to cover a few things that you talked about, um, most people go on cardio machines to try and lose fat and that's a quantitative mindset. Our biology works more with uh, cascades of events where um, if you did 10 sprints for 10 seconds, it'll take you with a minute rest in between under 20 minutes. You'll probably be burning more fat and calories the rest of the day than 30 minutes on the Stairmaster. Um, so high intensity is great. One of the uh, lowest hanging fruits, I think, for people would be sprinting up a hill. It encourages pretty damn good mechanics yeah um then again common sense listen to your body if it's trying to speak to you um two the women who are fearful of lifting big weights because they don't want to get big and buff um take it from many hearing many stories in my own uh stories of why can't i get bigger i'm lifting really really heavy <laughs> And lots of men across the country have this like, God, I just plateau and I can't get over 220 pounds or whatever. Um, it's pretty hard to pull it on muscle mass. There's a lot of things you need to do. Mm -hmm. Lifting heavy weight is good. However, um, investigate how you move. Video yourself. Look in a mirror. Have a person watch you. I th think there's a lot of implicit understanding of movement if they just open their eyes. I go to say Globo gyms quite often when I travel and I see people pulling 315 pounds off the ground, which is a lot. And their back is so rounded and they've never thought to shift their focus from the weight to how they move. Hmm. Um, and so what I would say is explore an attitude of repetition without repetition. Listen to your body with that and repetition without repetition is how many different ways can you repeat the same task of lifting the weight off the ground and putting it back down and understanding or feeling have a good communication with your body that oh my knee going in like that that doesn't feel good it feels better 
and exploring that with lighter weight before you go to heavier weight. Mm -hmm. The heavier you go, the less movement variability you are afforded. Mm -hmm. And so you have permission to get creative with how you move. You don't have to just do what magazines tell you, what a low quality personal trainer tells you, or what other people in the gym are doing. There's more creativity out there. My Instagram, if you look at it, it's at apiros.team, A-P-I-R-O-S. You'll see a huge variety of things. Some of them have no weight at all. And I would encourage people to try that and experiment with it with the agreement that you will listen to your body and not push through pain because I'm not there to guide you through it. Yeah. Beautiful. So what about this, uh, this issue of people kind of, um, always stuck in the same routine? Do you have any thoughts on like periodization and like how to, how to, to vary workouts over time? I have a lot of thoughts on periodization. <laughs> Can you summarize them and, and, or give me the, uh, like a, a basic gist in two minutes since we're running short on time? Yeah. Periodization is more of a myth. Um, I'm a big fan of if you feel good enough to lift really heavy that day, do it. If you feel like maybe you want to lift at a moderate weight, but a lot of repetitions, do that. Um, and if you're trying to go towards certain goals, vary things up every few weeks so that your body adapts to that stressor. Okay, now it's time to get creative. I can't do it the same way. And so I got to find a different way to put the weight over my head. I did that same way for two weeks. We can do this on a macro level. Now I got to find a different way for the next two weeks, mm -hmm. meaning different speed, tempo. You can pause different movements. Um, that's, I would say that's my two minute summary. Most of the stuff about like specific block periodization stuff. Yeah, and let, let me actually summarize that because yeah. probably a lot of people listening are, are not familiar with it, but periodization and block periodization is this concept of like basically do low reps and heavy weight for a period of time, then like moderate reps for a period of time, uh, and then high reps for a period of time, and then kind of th there's what's called deloading weeks in between, and then you kind of cycle through different phases that are different in terms of the number of reps and the, and the, whether it's real heavy weights or lighter weights for higher reps. That's a basic idea of it. And there's all kinds of different uh, subtypes of different kinds of periodization that have been created for, for different roles and lots of different comp complexities to it. But the, that's the basic gist of it. So yeah. what you're saying is you don't really believe in that and you believe in kind of like more of a, an intuitive approach of um, shifting things every couple of weeks or, or based on what you feel like doing on that given day. Yeah. Just because you've wrote and written down plan a for today to work out, but you don't feel like doing plan a doesn't mean you should stick to it. Again, your body is this beautifully arc, uh, created instrument that will tell you, guide you uh, through movement. And so based on someone's body language that comes in, I'm going to crumple up and throw plan A out the window because I know they're not ready for that and that's not optimal for them. Mm -hmm. And so I would encourage people to do that and then they get a better feedback from their brain and their body. Yeah. What, what would you say to somebody who has no concept of how to listen to their body or be intuitive about what their body might need on any given day? Maybe they need some structure to start with to get an idea of, like maybe they've never even tried any period of time where they've done let, let's say a, a woman who's never graduated beyond uh, the 15 pound dumbbells or never even tried any weight training at all who has no concept of what it's like to do heavier weights for less reps or, or lighter weights for more reps but who's just looking to get into weight training is there any kind of generalized template for a person to get familiarized that or, or, or just like any kind of basic couple tips that you might give that person they're going to explore based off their own comfort zone and based off of their own beliefs. If they believe they see that heavy weight, they can go pick it up. I'd encourage them to go do that because their mood, their mindset, everything is shifted towards that, which will make it more likely to happen. However, um, it could just be like you slowly walking into the deeper end of the pool. It gets a little gradual. You just 
dip your toe in and it's maybe more of a linear approach where you go from the 15 pounds. Okay, I'm going to do the 20. Oh, that was fine. I'm going to do the 25 next week. 20 and 25 was easy. I'm going to jump up to 40. But I can't do 15 reps with that. I'm only going to do five. And just um, experiment, not thinking that there's one right way or a template, mm -hmm. um, but rather experiment and know that nothing is wrong. I think it's a spectrum of lower quality and higher quality. Um, but this more baby step, relative baby step approach for each individual will be a good guide for them. And then as far as getting in tune with their body, I'm a big fan of the more you look, the more you see. Mm. What do you mean by that? Here's an analogy. I never had Chicago deep dish pizza before this year. I was uh, a teaching an event in Chicago and one of my best friends, um, came and visited me in Chicago from Indiana and he took me to his favorite pizza spot when he lived there. And I was just so in the moment eating this pizza and it was so good. And I was like, dude, do you, do you taste the butter and the crust? Oh, it's so good. And he's like, no. And all I said was, Hey, look for it. And then he found it. Mm -hmm. And so asking yourself the question of how does this feel in my back? When I lift this up, hmm, I can't really put a word on it, but maybe it's like not so good. I'm going to try a different position or maybe I'm going to expand my stomach pushing against my waistband and see how that makes my back feel. Oh, okay. Now that's a different experience that I can compare it to and it's better. I'm going to do that or, oh, that's worse. I don't want to do that. I'm going to go away from that. Is that a good guide? Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. So you've alluded to uh, your movement vitamins a couple times so far. Um, mm -hmm. I want you to kind of talk about what that is. And I know that's like basically the foundation of everything, right? Kind of it all starts with movement vitamins. Uh, and and your, this is kind of like how you start people off as far as like building a foundation your movement vitamin series. So what is a movement vitamin? This is a, a term that you've created. Uh, first of all, define it and then talk about your movement vitamin series and where people can get it. So a great analogy is with food. I love food. And that's how I orchestrate some of my workouts is around menu items. And so I just got one of my first tests back from health optimization. One of the last guests you had on was Dr. Ted Achikoso, the creator of that. And I found out I was deficient in lots of B vitamins. So you can be deficient in B vitamins and you can be deficient in say core stability, ankle mobility, or um, rotational pattern deficiency. And so this is a supplemental vitamin in an instructional video to improve that quality of your movement, um, movement optimization repertoire. And I try and keep them pretty short. The longest one is about feet with 10 minutes, but most of them are in between two and five minutes. I try to make it so that anyone can do them anywhere. Um, and then after you've got your movement vitamins uh, ingested, experienced, and no more have less movement deficiencies, then I encourage my athletes as, to explore onto the first entree or an appetizer which is maybe a more intense or more stressful movement that promotes a better adaptation towards that deficiency. So it's maybe a weighted movement or a faster movement that is in the same category as this movement deficiency. Hmm. Makes sense. So this is, this is basically like, by, by opting into this, people can actually get you visually demonstrating and teaching how to kind of build this foundation of movement, of all these different patterns of movement vitamins into their life, build greater mobility, greater function, um, decrease pain in their body, and, and avoid injury and pain and loss of function later in life. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I mean, I don't think people need to lift up weights to avoid injury and move well. Yeah. Beautiful. So where can people go to get that information? And, uh, and it's free. Is that correct? Yeah, it's all free.
Okay. Um, I try to send it out every week. Um, sometimes it's twice a week. Sometimes it's once every 10 days. Depends on my schedule. Okay. Um, and do you do a different one every week? Yeah, I don't, I try to do different ones, different themes um, each week. And some of them I plan uh, to repeat with a higher sense of quality. So say it's the first lower quality of um, what's the broad deep squat instructional movement vitamin. How can we get into deeper quality of the deep squat once you've practiced it, a graduating thing? You can find it at www.apiros, A-P as in Peter, I-R-O-S dot team slash subscribe. Um, if you can't find it, it's on a few of the pages at the bottom. You just click subscribe to our update, our movement vitamin update um, or email newsletter, wherever it's listed. Okay. And, and we'll also put a link to it on the podcast page for this episode as well. Um, so you can get, and then one other question I have is in that free movement, new movement vitamin series, do you also have a link to prior videos that you've done? Like when first, if somebody first uh, signs up for it, are you going to deliver like a series of, of the, maybe the 10 most important foundational ones that someone should go through? Yeah, when you first sign up, you'll get a kind of a welcome email and there's an intro video and the first movement vitamin. And then with that, that is a link to the Vimeo and YouTube archive. And so the idea is with this vitamin, you can then make your own menu or recipe, your own playlist really, but to use the food analogies. And so then for these two weeks or four weeks, I'm going to go through movement vitamins one, seven, and nine mm -hmm. or whatever because those what that's what makes me feel best okay i've done those for four weeks i'm gonna do different ones or i'm gonna try the new one that comes out every week and then maybe there's a greatest hits that like oh you know what i'm always gonna need number two which is hanging um and then that stays in your program or your menu for as long as your practice is beautiful and it's aperos apiros.team slash what was it subscribe subscribe okay and then uh i know you're also big on instagram where can people follow you there that's also just at apiros.team and if anybody has any questions you can please reach out if you can't find anything just ask uh, my email is austin a-u-s-t-i-n at apiros.team Okay. And you are in the Santa Cruz area. Is Santa that correct? Area. And yeah. so if anybody's located in that area or that vicinity of the Bay Area and they are interested in working with you, um, how should they contact you? Uh, email would be best. And we, I do have um, some, some of the other people at Apiros do travel and they're mobile and are up in San Francisco or San Jose area. So, um, Location in the Bay Area is not, uh, you don't have to live in Santa Cruz or nearby to get some help. Okay. Um, what's, what's your email that people can reach you at? Austin, A-U-S-T-I-N, at apiros.team. Okay. Beautiful. Well, Austin, thank you so much. This has been an absolute pleasure to connect with you again, my friend. And, uh, and thank you for sharing your, your brilliance and your wisdom with my audience. I, I really appreciate it. Dude, thank you. I mean, I really appreciate it. And I'm, I'm really happy to hopefully make an impact on, on their energy, their health and their movement. Yes, I, I know that it will. I, and I'm, I know from, you know, personal experience of my history of doing some of this work and getting people more physically functional, it honestly just makes a huge difference in their, not, not just their physical function, not just their pain, but their energy levels, their brain function, their mood, I mean, it just translates into so many benefits in their life. It just, the trickle down effect is, is amazing. So thank you. This stuff is, is critically important. And, uh, and I, I love a lot of these little tips and, and I learned several things from you as well. So, uh, this has been awesome, my friend. So take care. And I, I look forward to having another conversation with you very soon. Yeah. Thank you.